All right. So in this module, we're going to talk about the elastic modules, one of the elastic properties I mentioned. And this will also tie back in to earlier in the semester when we talked about bond force diagrams, and you'll hopefully see the connection fairly soon. All right. So metals and other materials as well, but we're going to focus on metals to start, um, exhibit this linear elastic behavior I just showed you. And that is one where the stress is proportional to the strain or the force is proportional to the displacement. And so this proportionality um, gets a certain law and that's the, what you see down here and that's known as Hooke's law. Maybe you've seen this before, but it's basically the proportion between stress, sigma, is equal to, and then the proportionality constant, and then strain. And so this is basically the slope of the stress-strain plot that we've been talking about. And so if you see down here, the stress, uh, sorry, strain, stress, and then we see it's linear. And so the slope is that uh, proportionality constant. And we call that the modulus of elasticity or elastic modulus or Young's modulus. So it always has modulus in the word, but you might hear Young's, you might hear elastic modulus. It's all the same thing. And we give it the symbol E, capital E for the most part. So this is what tells us how much force or how much stress it takes to strain it a certain amount, right? That's what this is telling us. We apply a certain force um, and then it tells us about the extension. But again, remember, this is all reversible. So if we remove that stress, it goes back um, to its original position at here. Uh, but this also, uh, compression and tension uh, are considered basically the same, right? So compression would just be this negative coordinates that we see down here. Uh, but Hooke's law applies to, to both that we see. All right, so what is this modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus? So this is what that slope of the bond force diagram was at F equal zero. So if we go back to that, so this is the, the bond force diagram. We see separation distance between the atoms and then the force it takes to do that. So at zero, that's the equilibrium bond distance, if you remember. That's the spacing uh, that is at equilibrium because no forces are acting. So what happens is you can envision it as if you're trying to uh, separate the atoms, right, stretch them apart, uh, then you're basically going toward the right of the curve. And if you're trying to compress the atoms further closer together, then you're going to the left, right, over here, uh, based on the separation. And so the slope here basically tells you how much force uh, is required to separate them some known distance, right? So if I want to go this amount over in separation, I have to go this far up. Or if I want to uh, bring them this much closer together, I have to go all the way down here in force, right? So it tells us about uh, the strength of the bond, right? How much force is required to do this. And so we, talk, we think of this Young's modulus as a measure of the bond strength um, or the material's stiffness or compliance in a way, right? So stiffness is basically how hard or how how hard they are to, uh, to, to get those bonds stretched or compressed. And then compliance is the opposite. So that's more of a weak uh, bond. And so basically in, in this one, the strongly bonded one, the red curve is stiff. And then this blue one, uh, which has a much uh, smaller slope is more compliant. Uh, and so that's the terminology that we use with these materials. All right, so we just talked about tension and compression. However, there are similar moduli in the other stress states that we might be able to think of, right? For uh, torsion, uh, where we apply a twisting motion, we can look at the torsional stress uh, versus dis uh, strain and the slope of that here is G, and that's the shear modulus. So again, it, it basically the resistance to twisting that sample. And then there's also a bulk modulus K when we have one of those a compressive uh, hydrostatic compression, where we basically have compression all around. And so that modulus is known as the bulk modulus. So they all have 
um, every type of testing is going to have a modulus related to the elastic uh, properties of the bonds. The good, the uh, the important thing for us though is that there's usually these special relations between what we call isotropic materials. So isotropic, iso means the same, and then tropic talks about the properties, right? So the properties are the same in all directions. So when that is the case, we can actually um, define the bulk, uh, sorry, the shear modulus or the bulk modulus by the elastic. And so that's why when we first talked about mechanical properties, we talked about the tension test, because that's a very simple test that people are accustomed to. And if the material is uniform in all directions, we don't even need to perform a shear test or a, a, a hydrostatic test because we can get those moduli from knowing the elastic uh, tensile properties. So that's the importance of, of these relationships down here. Um, you probably won't end up using these too much, but I just wanted to show you that um, if the material is uniform in all directions, we don't actually need to perform those tests in order to obtain the moduli in those shear stresses or in those stress states. All right, so let's get a sense of the values for Young's modulus or elastic modulus. So for metals, like we talked about in the very beginning, um, we can just approximate that the Young's modulus is going to be on the order of 100 gigapascals, right? So when we talked about the gummy material, our, um, uh, our force forces came out to be kilopascals, and now we've gone up from kilo to mega to giga, right? So this is uh, much stronger than, um, than that gummy material. And so uh, just to get an idea, in gigapascals, something like tungsten is all the way up at 407 gigapascals, and then uh, magnesium, which is uh, much more compliant, is only 45 gigapascals. And you can see all the ones in the, in the middle. Um, nickel and steel are about 200, titanium, copper, and brass are about 100. So uh, that's a good, a good thing to have a general um, order of magnitude of where these Young's modulus be in the order, order of, again, uh, ten, uh, hundreds of gigapascals is what we're talking about. All right, another important thing to, to mention when we're talking about the elastic modulus is that it's a measure of the bonding, right? And so the strength of those bonds. So if we're talking about a crystal, the bonding is different in different directions in different planes. So the because the spacing is different, right? We have some um, planes that are very uh, close packed, and then others that are less close packed. And so the modulus is going to depend on the direction that you deform it for these single crystals. And so we call that anisotropic, right? So it's not the same in all direction is basically how you read that word. Um, and so an example here is silicon. We have a single crystal of silicon, Si. And if your, <coughs> excuse me, if your um, modulus is tested uh, along uh, the uh, 100 plane or uh, perpendicular to this plane, the uh, elastic modulus is 129 gigapascals. If it's the 110, normal to that, it's 168 gigapascals. And then if it's the 111, which again is close, um, uh, close packed, then that is, um, Excuse me. This is actually um, this is actually not FCC. This is diamond. Uh, so it is not close back. But the one one one, um, the uh, if we're testing uh, normal to that, then our elastic modulus is the highest, one eighty seven. So it depends on the direction. Is the important takeaway here. However, if you have a polycrystalline sample of silicon, the value is one sixty nine, which you see is kind of in the middle of all three of these values. And that's because, again, we have all of these crystals at different orientations, and so the modulus is uh, basically a weighted average of these different values that we see because of the orientations of the individual crystals. So polycrystalline materials tend to be isotropic, same in all directions, because they're normalized or, or they're averaging the different planes, whereas single crystals are anisotropic because they depend on the direction. All right, so uh, another factor that will influence the elastic modulus. So we just talked about direction, but also temperature. 
right? Bonding is going to be related to temperature. And so that uh, modulus decreases with increasing temperature because things are getting further apart, right? The bonds are getting weaker and weaker at the higher temperatures. So here you see tungsten. If we uh, test it at very low temperatures, it's above 400. And then up to uh, 800, we see that it goes down to about um, 350. And aluminum, the same thing. It goes down. All of these go down with temperature. So that's an important factor. A lot of times you'll just be talking about something like room temperature. So somewhere around here. Uh, but if you use these temperatures at very low temperatures or very high temperatures, there can be differences in the stiffness or compliance.